Hi everyone, I am Josh. Welcome back to my channel yet again. This time for the mid-year freakout tag. Now I know that it is no longer the middle of the year. It is going on August, probably will be August by the time this goes up. But this was one of my favorite tags that I did last year, and I really wanted to do it this year. But if you've been following my channel, then you know I've been away. I've been having a hard time getting back in the flow of things, and I'm managing to keep up one video a week. I'd like to keep get that you know picked up again, but right now it's just part of that, and I don't want to fuck up the flow of you know getting at least one out a week. I think it's a good pattern to maintain, even if it's not as high as I'd like. But nevertheless, we're here, and I still want to do this, even if it is just a little bit late. The first one here is best book you've read so far in 2021 and this one was a lot easier than last year honestly where oh where are the books that i had okay my place is a bit of a mess and i have books all over the place um so the first one is going to be the detransition baby by tori peters i've talked about this several times now it follows the story of two trans women one of which detransitions and in the complications of all that they break up and this story follows after that. It's ours with them being separated and with one the one who de transitioned going out with the cis woman and impregnating her. And it then introduces this sort of trifecta where he convinces his new girlfriend to try a certain setup with his ex-girlfriend um, because his ex-girlfriend had always wanted to have a baby even though she can't give birth as a trans woman. And it creates this really fascinating sort of scenario that seems a little convoluted but also just fascinating something that i feel like could happen in the real world even if it's not something that would necessarily happen very often and really the story isn't about that one scenario if you're approaching this for like a plot driven book it's not that it's really an opportunity to use that as a way to study our characters particularly our two main trans characters and their relationship now when flashbacks to the past and just get a good idea of them their personality the wants their needs as individuals and uh, the, the book just worked really well for me. I just talked about this in other videos I'm filming back to back. So I feel like my excitement's not showing. And that's just because I'm basically saying the same thing I said before. But I swear, this book, definitely one of my favorites of the year. The question will be is whether or not it's going to beat out Giovanni's Room, which I'm not sure where I put it. But I just finished this, and technically it really shouldn't be on this list because I finished it in July. And I'd say mid-year freakout tag should be for books before July. But I just finished this, and this book was phenomenal. These characters were very complicated. I wouldn't say they're necessarily likable. Even Giovanni, who is very sympathetic in a lot of ways. I should give you a description of it, which I will in a second. But generally speaking, they're both... They're both complex characters who aren't entirely likable. So this book follows this one American man who is in France, and he separated from his uh, lover, his um, what's her name, what's it called, his fiance, and so he just goes out with a friend who happens to be queer um, in some way or fashion. And he says he's not queer, but eventually the story starts out with him obviously meeting Giovanni, who is this French barman who he gets entangled with. And while he's there, he stays in Giovanni's room. And the book is kind of kind of very dark. I don't see what's going to happen, but the book starts out from the future of them already being broken up and something's happened. Something's happened with Giovanni and we have an idea of what that is. And the book's basically kind of like the death of Itagoji, where we're getting flashbacks to how everything played out, as well as current events of what's going on, how things are progressing. And at some point, those two events converge at one point where we get to the conclusion of the book. And it's devastating, it's heartbreaking, and our characters are very flawed. And at the foundation of it, though, I just, it just worked really well. A very well-written book. The biggest flaw I'd say in this book is probably the misogyny. And I feel like he tries to have a conversation from a female character's perspective to sort of counteract that, but I don't think it works. I'm not sure if it's just a attitude of the time or something specific about James Baldwin. There's also homophobia in here, but I, I think as a queer man, I read it in a very different way than I've heard other people have read it, where the queerness, like the homophobia isn't, it isn't not being addressed. It's very much like the consequences of what's happening, of the feelings that this person has to live with for the rest of their life. That is the consequence of the homophobia. Like it's not, not there. I think many queer men 
and most queer men have had to deal with this sort of internal dialogue with yourself to try and understand yourself, your identity, and trying to reckon with this sort of internal hatred you might have. It's definitely something I've had to experience being raised in a, a southern Christian home, and it's very much reflected in this book. And so I think that was one of the most powerful parts about it. A really, really good book. The best sequel you've read all year. And I haven't read that many, but there were two that really stuck out. So I'm going to start with The Broken Kingdoms. And I really like this. I was worried because I liked the first one, but I was worried I wouldn't remember the details. And this series, I feel like, is, is similar to Octavia Butler's approach to series in the sense that they all feel very standalone. Um, but this is a book or series that's set in this sort of fantasy kingdom where the humans interact with gods and in the first book we have the situation where the gods are being controlled by these hierarchy of people and they, therefore they have the power. In the second one we've moved forward in time to a different series of events. I don't want to spoil it so I won't say what exactly the setup is. We have new characters but also some that carry over. I think it's a decent amount of time in the future and it's just a unique part of the story, a new story, a new perspective and I was worried about that because I, I like keeping the characters I know and love. I hate having to learn new things because it's just another point of, of contact why I might get lost. But it worked. It worked really well. I look forward to the last one, honestly. It was just a solid, solid continuation to the series. If you like sort of god-type books, books that use gods and their gods as characters, this is, a, I think, a good one to go with. Another one here would be A Song Flung Up to Heaven. And this one I think I gave four to four and a half stars. I actually gave them both four to four and a half stars. And this is the sixth book in Maya Angelou's biography or memoir series. And I chose to, to mention this one here because after the first one, I feel like it all became all the books became sort of continual uh, building on the last ones instead of working as an independent novel. And I think it's important they do both, personally. And I think this one really does that, does that. If you look at the list of books that she's published on Goodreads, and you'll see the most popular ones would be the first one, would be, I think, the sixth one, the seventh one. And I think part of that, the reason you see this resurgence in popularity of the sixth one, is going to be because of the, the decision to sort of make it feel more like its own. And I think it really made it shine because of that. It worked really well here. Also, it's narrated by her, so it's hard not to love this, that, that, that aspect of it. Many of the books, several of the books in the in-between part of this memoir series aren't narrated by her. And if you haven't heard her narrate her on memoir, Jesus Christ, you need to stop what you're doing and listen to her narrate. I know how the cage bird sings. Hi, I forgot about number three, which is supposed to be your favorite reread. And I don't remember all the books I reread. So I'm just gonna go to the ones that come to mind because I guess that's by definition what makes a favorite, or at least it helps. And I'm actually gonna pick two that's gonna be a book two and four of the Wayward Children series. I reread this at least for the second time. I want to read it again. Got them on the Sticks and Bones. So good, Jack and Jill, and In the Absent Dream. I just, I adore both of these. This is my favorite because I love the darkness of it, but I do love the concept here of the Goblin Market, of a fair exchange. I, just, I love that logic, even though that's not my world by far. Those are my favorite rereads for the year so far. Okay, next is going to be a new release you haven't read this year that you want to. Is that what that says? Hold on, I can't see. I can't see without his glasses. Where is his glasses? He can't see without his glasses. A new release you haven't read, but you want to. That was basically the same thing. And, you know, this was going to be Madam Speaker by Susan Page, which is about Nancy Pelosi, Speaker of the House. But I have read it in July, and technically I think it could still work, because I had, wouldn't have read it before the middle of the year. Middle of the year. But this was, like, the big one I was going to say. And other than that, like, do I have one here? I have Dawn by Octavia Butler, book one of the, what is it, Lilith's Brood series. And this isn't a new release, but... I mean, the cover is, so I'm gonna count that as a new release. This is one that was recently released and I wanna read it, I haven't read it yet. Um, otherwise, it would have been Madam Speaker, but I've read that one now. The good thing about this right here, even though it's coming in late, is I was already thinking about it since since June. And because of that, I was thinking about the questions, what my answers would be, and obviously, this has sort of had me thinking about what my TBR is going to be moving forward. Hence why I've since read Madam Speaker, because it was something I think to myself, I wanted to read that, I haven't done it yet, let's get to it. But anyways, moving on. Your most anticipated release for the second half of the year. Uh, I don't have a lot of those that I plan on reading, but I think it's going to be book two of the Over the Woodward Wall series. Um, I guess the Up and Under series. It's called Along the Salt Y C by Sh Shirley Jackson, by uh, Shauna McGuire, who has an uncanny resemblance to Shirley Jackson. <laughs> But this is book two. I'm excited to read it. I don't expect it to be as good as the Wayward Children series, but it's one that I'm like I'm really invested in, and I'm excited to see the story continue. I'll probably just buy the audiobook. It's one of the few books that I'm really excited to read, even though I don't own it. 
physical yet. There, then there are other books that are being re-released on audio. We have Shirley Jackson, her earlier works. I found out <laughs> when I was thinking about, see if there's an audiobook for these works. I didn't think there was, but I was I think I'm planning on reading one next month in August, and I wanted to see if there's an audiobook, and then I saw there was now an audiobook coming out in October. So I've since, like, I've since sort of recalibrated, reorganized how I'm gonna read them, but all of Shirley Jackson's early works being released on audio. That's pretty much means all of her novels are now going to be on audio, and I'm super psyched. Coming out, what is it, October 21st or something? But I plan on, I'm like super psyched for that. I led, I read last year, Shirley Jackson by Ruth Franklin, A Rather Haunted Life, one of my favorite books of last year. Such a phenomenal, phenomenal literary uh, biography, and it made me want to read her entire collection, which I now intend to do, and it's only going to be easier now that it's on audio. The other one here I want to mention is The Between by Tanner Reeve Dew, one of her few books that are not on audio and it's not getting released. I'm so psyched for that because I was already planning on reading it this year and it's perfect timing. Next one's going to be Hattie McDaniel, Black Ambition in White Hollywood. This is by the same author, Jill Watts, that read that wrote my favorite book of last year. Favorite nonfiction, but possibly even my favorite book of the entire year. Was it my favorite? Or was it Ruth Franklin? They were all up there. But that was The Black Cabinet by Jill Watts. This was about uh, black figures in government who in position of the power came together to basically uh, advocate and fight for black Americans in America during the Roosevelt era. And now we have this book, which I recently bought, and I, then I found out, Jesus, it's being released on audio. Everything's being released on audio these days. We live in a, such a wonderful time to be alive. Everything is so accessible, and I'm so excited be able to listen to this when it comes out, I think also in October. I want to get to it this year, but we'll see. I'm still excited for this being released on audio. It's going to fall on my head. I just know it is. Moving on with this. Biggest Disappointment. And I really did want to say these two books here, but they, they genuinely are the biggest disappointments. They're both books that I actually liked, but I had high expectations and they let me down. First is going to be Sorrow Land by River Solomon. And I can give this four stars, maybe three and a half to four stars. This is their newest book about basically a woman who escapes a cult, a young woman who has two children, has to raise them, and she tries to do it on her own. And in doing so, it explores themes to do with control, oppression, race, and religion. And they're all fascinating ideas, but there was something about the story that just did not feel like it reached the level of their previous works. And, and after I thought about it more since my wrap up for this, I think the reason for that is, for me, was the story felt fundamentally mundane. It's not a mundane story. There was a lot of there is a speculative nature to it, but I think it was this, the I think it was just let down with the speculative side of the, of the narrative and how it just it didn't reach the depths uh, of imagination that I was expecting it to. Not to say that they aren't imaginative. That the story's not imaginative. It's just I was expecting something a bit more, you know, like I said, speculative. And then the other one is going to be Wild Beauty by Anna Marika Moore. Another one that I, I liked, genuinely, it just felt like we're getting the same stories. Not the same narrative exactly, but the same structure, and I'm getting bored with it. Um, basically, they write stories about modern-day children or teenagers who have sort of a tie to some type of unique fairy tale type origin story. It all ties in to make tell this beautifully written, beautifully profound story with a range of diverse characters, genders and, and queerness, um, and that I, I appreciate it for that. But I'm hoping to feel something different in their future works, to be honest. The biggest surprise here, and now at the time, like I was, I was so excited. So I get, I think, it, so I think it really deserves to be here because of, I remember my thought, that my feelings of this was so strong. I was so excited. Came to this author. First off, this book, even several months later, still smells amazing. I came to this author because of hearing them um, just discuss Canada Reads of 2020, and I heard they had a new book coming. So I, I decided to pre-order it, and then I found it on on NetGalley, and I ordered that, and I got the ER. So I started reading it, and little did I know this was a speculative dystopian narrative, and it. it hit everything I love. And the writing was, was fast paced and, and, and just really engaging. Since I've heard the reviews and reflected on it, the book doesn't hit as hard as the first time, but still a solid book. I think it helped that I did not put in the effort to hear anything about this. So I had no expectations. I honestly just thought it was going to be a contemporary narrative of some sort. And I realized it was just not that at all. And I hate this contemporary narratives. It's just that it was much more aligned with what I consider my my top tier genre. The other one here is going to be, oh, one that was, oh my God, I, I, if I had to recommend, like this is, 
this is one I really would recommend to people, especially since I think it's just out of date now. And it's called um, The Morrison Chronicles by Ray Bradbury. This is a series of chronological and connected short stories about Ameri not America, United, not United States, what's wrong with me? The Earth going to Mars. This is set during like the 50s or something. Oh, sorry, it was written during that time and it's set in the near or far future. So the science in here is very bad, but who cares? Like it's speculative fiction and it still works really well. It's and it's it's not really about that. It's just more about using that as a way to explore societal issues, Earth and the problems with Earth, how we approach things, our mindset as a society, and oh my god. It's really, really good. It's just, it's really good. I was worried because I, I, I struggled with his other book, Something Wicked This Way Comes, which just felt like it was written in the older style. I found it hard to connect with that sort of older writing style. I was afraid it was to be the same thing. It, just, it wasn't. It just, it worked really, really well. And it's narrated by Scott Brick, one of my favorite narrators. Such a highly recommendation here. Oh, solid, solid book. Oh, this is why I read. This is why I read right here or for books like this. Okay, I'm only halfway through this. Uh, favorite new author, debut or otherwise. And when I say, when I pick a favorite, and I do think this will be on my favorite author's list of the end of the year, I feel like I have to have read at least two of their books, two to have said that. And for that reason, I'm gonna be picking, I think the, the best choice here is gonna be James Baldwin. I have read two of his works, Giovanni's Room, which is a favorite of the year, and Going to Meet the Man, which is a set of short stories. They both were fantastic, and I love the writing style, and I'm so excited to dig into the rest of his works. I'm even more excited that wherever the hell I have his collection, it's like a Library from Air collection, looks like this. I'm pretty sure there were three of these. No, two of them. Two, at least two, maybe even three of his works, like early works, late works, and then short stories or collections, I'm not sure. But there's a lot and I'm excited to dig into them. I really am. New, new favorite character for the year. And I don't know, nothing really resonated hard with me. Um, so I'm gonna pick a stupid stupid answer here. And that's gonna be Madam Speaker, rather Nancy Pelosi. I did just read this, so it's fresh on my mind, but I do have a lot of respect for Nancy Pelosi. And have I talked about this on a video yet? If not, I'm gonna be doing a review. I think I talked about it. Did I? Yes, MITBI already finished at that point, but I did really like those characters. Other than that, like, I don't know, there's nothing really stuck out. Other problem with that, this question is that I struggle with remembering a lot of details and character names, something that go very fast. And if I can't remember their name, it's hard to say they're my favorite character. I thought I was gonna get characters or even for a sequel, I thought it was gonna be one of the Patternist books from RTV Butler, but I realized my two favorite ones I read sort of last year, not this year. Okay, so that's not true. It turns out I realized I actually read this in January, so just the beginning of this year. And I do think I could say there's a new K character from here, maybe. It's the only one that really sticks out. I want to say the main character, whose name I've already forgotten. But I also really like the main character of the first book, who is carried into this book. Her name is Onyanru, except her name changes in this book, and I forget what her new name is. Um, and the other thing is that though I don't really like her new character. I don't like what, how she changes in this book, which technically was written before the first one, even though they're chronologically this comes second. But this is a science fiction series by Octavia Butler. I've thought about it before. Basically, a world where people basically kind of have X-Men powers, but the focus of the series on people who had the ability to sort of connect their minds. What we see here is that we have a new figure of being able to harness, harness this power in a brand new way. And because of that, she's sort of, she's being used by this greater power who is trying to use her and pay more people like her to sort of, I guess, have a master race of sense. So I think I would say her. Probably, yeah. I don't remember her name. Oh, Onyanu's name is Emma. I see that now. I didn't like her as Emma as much for various reasons. Check out that table as Lori. Mary, that's it, Mary. Mary was her name. I liked Mary a lot, and I was—I don't want to spoil the rest of it. But let's just say I really liked her, and I guess this is the one of everything I've read. This does take out. I think it helps that I've read the rest of the series throughout the year, and literally just talked about the slow read. That's, that's last Sunday, but that's another favorite character, an actual character, not a real person. Books that made you cry, and for this one, I don't cry a lot. Generally, it's not because of what's in the book. It's it's what the book triggers from me. We're coming up on a year since my grandmother died, and so oftentimes when it comes to family, parentage, or, you know, just connection to family, that will happen. And one that I think I remember that happening was in Maya Angelou's books. One of them that I've read, I've read two of them this year, I think. And I remember she talks about a lot about her mother and her grandmother. Her grandmother raised her, and the bond there <clears throat> and it's um you know it's just easy to let my mind start rolling and start thinking about loss and what I've lost and get upset um so usually I'm just trying to think about it but that's usually when I cry yeah that's sad <laughs> okay um the other one 
would be The First Time She Drowned, a book that I don't, you might usually want for trigger warnings, but this book triggered me, I'm not gonna lie. It was, it was about a complicated relationship between a mother and a daughter, and I by no means am saying that's my relationship with my mother. But, I mean, everyone has their complications, and I, parts of this book resonated with me in a way that was very, very unsettling. I'm not sure if I cried, if not, I definitely was in the right mindset for it. A book that made you happy, and for this one, I don't read a lot of happy doopy books that just make you happy. And so I decided to go with the other one, which is going to be The Martial Chronicles. To be clear, this is not a happy story. It's actually very dark. But as you can see, I'm very happy when I talk about it because of my feelings about the book. The book is not happy, but my reaction to it is one of pure happiness. Most beautiful book you've bought this year. And oh, I've had so many gorgeous covers. Oh, where to begin? Teachers is her baby. Solid one. One of my top three here. Oompa Loompa Poompa Dee Doo. This gorgeous book here, look at that, you. An Unkindness of Ghosts by Yubira Solomon. Now, have I talked about this in a book haul? I think I may have. This is the hardback edition. I almost didn't buy this because like, you really need to spend $40 on a hardback? And then I got it and I was like, thank God I spent the money on this because it's one of those that, it's like it's the binding, it's a, it's a part of the binding, the cover is, and it's so gorgeous. Like, the cover itself is already gorgeous. And I already own this book, but I think it was the, the structural integrity and quality of the, of the hardback that made me just love it so much. And there was one more, Don, the first book of the the Lilith's Brew Trilogy. I do really love all these new covers that are coming out for Octavia Butler's books. I'm really hoping Kindred will get a new one and of course Fledgling, but right now they're working on the Lilith's Brew Trilogy series rather and the Pattern series just got released as well. I don't know if it's the same artist, but like all these gorgeous new covers. So gorgeous. But yeah, really excited for this one too. Like this book, but also the new set of covers. What books do you need to read before the end of the year? Oh, this is where I should have had stacks of books. Honestly, I had so many goals at the beginning of the year and at the end of last year. I'm not sure if they're all sticking. Um, there were still books, so I'm looking over there, uh, that I have from TBRs that just did not come together, or TBRs that fell apart. Some of the books from February, from May, are two big ones that I want to fit into my TBR. Um, I guess I could show you if you want to do that. This is a visual platform. From TBRs that did not go through, The Devourers by Indra Das, and this is a horror in story by an Indian author. One that I'd hoped to get to in May did not, so this is actually one that might be on my TBR for next month, actually, for August. Um, the Night Tiger one that I have had on my TBRs since I want to say last year, and it just keeps falling through. But after seeing the positive review from Bricks and La La on her channel, it makes me more excited. Like, that is not that I wasn't excited before. I just wasn't sure if it if it, how it would resonate with me, and it makes me more comfortable in my expectations of that book. Next is the Icarus Girl. I haven't read Helen or Yemi in a while. And she's one of those authors who I want to work my way through her entire collection. And part of that is just because it feels very literary, her work, and I struggle sometimes. This is just one that I've had my eye on for a while, and I'm, I want to get to it. And I'm not sure how fantastical it is. Her books always have like the faintest hint of fantasy, or magical realism, if you will. Being Mortal, another one that I want to get to by Atul Gurwandi. This is a nonfiction book about me medicine, about death, and about just being a surgeon. Now, one that I actually have very high expectations for, very, very high. And the rest here, Get back to my point about goals. It seems like the one goal that really is settling on me that seems to be like really one that I care about is that sticking to. All my classical books that I have on my TBR. I mean, Macros and Rachel is one, but it's really Daphne du Maurier in general. I want to read at least one of her books, probably two. Shirley Jackson, I already mentioned her. I want to read at least one of her books, probably two or three before the year is out. Wuthering Heights, one that did not get to last October. This October, I will. That's right. I've planned, I planned October this far in advance, probably since like last October. And I'm going to get to this. This is, gonna, this is one that I am going to prioritize for that month. Oh, look, I found James Baldwin. I've already read James Baldwin twice this year. I'm not ready to commit to that. And then the last one here that I need to read at least one, Charles Dickens, because that was one that I told myself I would get to this year. And so I'm making commitment now. I will get to Charles Dickens. This is a collection I've had, one of the oldest books that I've had. And I got it from Barnes & Noble years ago. And uh, I think I'm actually planning on reading a Charles Dickens next month. Surprise. It's probably going to be great expectations. Uh, one thing I'm excited about is these classics, is that, especially Charles Dickens, is that there's some great narrators out there. I'm particularly excited for Frank Muller, one of my favorite narrators as a kid or as a teenager. He died in 2008. But those are the books that are really, I think, are the ones that I'm really excited to get to or plan on getting to like there's a lot of them there but there's a lot of books i want to read and these are like i would put the highest priority now, your favorite video you posted and generally speaking i would say that my vlogs are often my favorite videos even though they're hardest to make and i feel like they don't always get the best views uh generally speaking i love 
it's it's I love the style that goes into them, especially when they're themed. I love being able to make a themed video around something I love, um, and I have themes that I want to do, and I just haven't gotten to because the problem with themes is that I love the themes more than the actual books in the themed video. So generally speaking, when I'm making a TBR I don't, and I have other books I want to read, the themes aren't enough to get me to read certain books over other books. But with that in, that in mind, reading Onyx Pages favorites um, and Jerry's favorites, I actually did that, filmed most of that in last year, end of last year, but it came up in early January. One reason my bookshelf I liked, it was an interesting thing that, to do. I, something I wanted to do since like, the beginning of my channel, I finally did it. Queer Reading Vlog, I think is the other vlog I want to mention here, is the one that I filmed in September of last year and I finally posted it. I'm so excited I did because I did really love that vlog. If you haven't watched it, check it out. It's actually pretty short, I think. So my phone doesn't like it when I try and film at 60 frames per second. So it overheated and I did not get the end of everything I recorded. So I'm here now to record the final thoughts of this mid-year freakout tag. And the last question I want to get to here is to call out some of my favorite community members. That is other book tours. And there are so many people I can mention here, but I decided to focus on five people. Not that they are particularly better than everyone else. Just that these are five people that I found myself watching or gravitating towards more so this last six months. People that are someone that I like to watch regularly and someone that is probably one of the first people that I jump on their videos for. And without further ado, let's just get who we're talking about here. First one's gonna be, she has the weirdest username here, token18 or something, it's an Egyptian word. And she has a very small channel, doesn't have a lot of viewers, but she makes a lot of great content and she reads a lot of, I think a lot of what I consider, I guess, cerebral works, and that's, she reads a lot of nonfiction and some fiction as well, and the fiction that she does read is very, I think, very deliberate in what she's reading about, and she has really great discussions or really great reviews about what she's reading and why she's read it, and one thing I really like about her is that she reads a lot of science in science fields that aren't necessarily something I generally cover, so it's nice to be able to get, to get uh, exposed to those other types of, of books in that, that genre. Next person I want to mention, or rather next group of people, is going to be couldn't pot a fiction plot or nil and scott and they are an australian couple who have uh, over 500 subscribers at this point and i have to say they are, have come one of my absolute favorite youtubers on here because they are just so charming and they interact so much with their viewers and they have such fantastic discussions about what they're talking about one of my favorite things about booktubers i've come to like is that you have a good booktuber who's able to basically have a really good deep discussion from either a, a talking point of some sort or, or a tag motivated discussion rather. Like you have questions that are very meant to motivate very deliberate conversations. Like there are tags out there that are just for fun. And there are tags that are meant to have to provoke the booktuber to have a serious reflection on some type of topic. And they cover those very often and their discussions are just so on point and it helps that because they're a couple, because they're a duo, they are able to have a serious conversation back and forth in a way that's hard when it's just one person talking to a camera. So I highly recommend them. The next person I want to make in here, recommend here is someone who has over a thousand subscribers at this point, but I consider them very similar to uh, Gunpowder Fiction and Plot in the sense of the content they cover. And that's going to be Hannah Penna's books. She has a lot of tags as well. She is someone who does not do a lot of the traditional stuff, stuff like wrap-ups and things like that, but she will perhaps give you a, a, a theme TBR at times. She may give you discussions about a particular book or set of books um, that are similar to that, and it's all framed around provoking the viewer, I think, to reflect on some topic that she's talking about. And I believe she is or was a professor or lecturer in either history or literature or the history of literature and it really reflects in what she presents in a way that's very deliberate and very, very well thought out and another person i highly recommend that's three groups three channels rather the last two are bigger the first one's going to be jess owens from her own channel obviously and she's obviously known largely for um all the amazing community videos she puts up which first off thank you so much there's so much amazing details that she's presenting and the amount of work she puts into that every week is just astonishing it just it's mind-boggling and of course she also does a lot of other amazing uh content that you see a lot a lot on youtube such as vlogs or or tbrs or wrap-ups reviews and it's another just a great person to check out out. The last person I want to mention is another big booktuber, someone who, when I first 
found their channel, I think I did not take to it right away. And then I went and I had a live show with Books Like Woe or Mara and with other people as well discussing this diversity. I think it was in late last year. And after doing that, I gave her channel a second look and I don't know, I just, I, something about it has really hooked me, and I found myself really just gravitating to her to read her so quick. I mean, she does a lot of the, the traditional stuff from TBRs, vlogs, and things like that, wrap-ups, but she also has a lot of great discussion videos. In fact, week to week, she usually has a live show where she'll pick a topic, and she'll talk about it for an hour or two. Oftentimes, it's just her, and her ability to have like, such an in-depth and thorough conversation with herself and an audience, when it's just her on the screen, it's just another mind-boggling thing. It's just, it's so talented and such great content. Uh, and those are the five people I want to think about. Again, I'm not saying I don't watch a lot of people that I don't love. It's just right now, in the last six months, this mid-year, I find those being the top five people I think that I've gravitated more towards. Now we've reached the conclusion of this tag. I can't believe I finally got this done, and thank you so much if you made it to the end. If you did, why don't you give me that little emoji that shows, uh, like a screaming face, like ah, you know, from the from the painting, and just to show you made it this far. And as always, hope you all stay safe, and I'll see you all next time. Okay.